This is Rick Rule for Real Vision and Sprott US Media. Today, I have the good fortune to introduce a friend of very long standing, Tom Kaplan. The theme of this is know who, which is to say a lot of investing is knowing how to do it, but an important part of investing too is knowing the people who have been successful and finding out why. So while we will discuss many facets of investing and many facets of life with Tom Kaplan, we will always bring it back to the theme of what caused you to do this, what caused you to do that, how did you learn from your successes, how did you learn from your failures, how did building businesses make you a better investor, and what lessons that you have learned can you impart to others? So Tom, with that introduction, let's get started. And let's begin at the beginning. I was fascinated when you and I visited personally uh, about the discussion you had uh, around going to university majoring in history. Not many tycoons, as far as I know, start with the academic background in history that you had. First off, how did you choose history as a young man? And secondly, how, if at all, did the study of uh, history influence your investing and possibly make you a better investor? Well, um, I knew that history uh, would be my, um, certainly my avocation um, when I was very young. Most of the passions in my life um, really began to emerge when I was six, seven, eight years old, and history was no exception. Uh, by the time I was uh, 10, 11 years old, I was reading Lives of the Caesars by Suetonius, um, and I understood that I could see things in history that just came very naturally to me. Um, I decided that I wanted to study history at the best university, um, which uh, exists for history, in my opinion. Um, and that was really prompted by watching a professor being interviewed on television. Uh, this is back in the day when there were only four channels and one of them was PBS. And he was asked, where could you get the best education as an undergraduate in history? And he said, Oxford. Why? Because it's still the only place, and with Cambridge, where you could learn one-on-one -on -one, um, with a world-class professor. And I felt that was so uneconomic that um, I wanted to be able to participate in that before they likely um, turned their back away from that model. Um, the good news is they never did turn their back on that. They understood that that was part of their brand franchise. But as a result of that, um, I went to school in Switzerland in order to take exams that would allow me to go to Oxford. If I was able to meet their requirements, I was. And I pursued history, undergraduate, and loved it, as I expected, and stayed all the way through to getting my PhD. And at that point, I had to decide what to do with my life. And one series of accidents after another uh, took me into natural resources. My relative advantage is that I'm neither a geologist nor an engineer, but I do understand cycles very well. And I'm able to extrapolate from those cycles how to be able to get maximum leverage to a theme and play it. And for some reason, um, multiple reasons, uh, natural resources lend themselves to that kind of sensibility. It's interesting that you say that, Tom, and I've, I've thought about it since our initial discussion. Your entry into natural resources. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important, is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you one dollar. I don't think you can afford to be without it. If my memory serves me well, uh, uh, unfortunately for me, you're somewhat younger than I, came after the resources boom of the 1970s. Uh, it, it could be argued that the period, in fact, 1980 to two, uh, as late as 2000, 
uh, was really a sort of an echo, a recovery from an overbought top. How did you see the cycle within the cycle that allowed you to play what is probably more recovery from an oversold bottom than a bull market? What is it about your background that allowed you to be that subtle? Well, at the time when I started to look at uh, natural resources, I began with silver in 1993. Um, the hunts, of course, had uh, taken silver to $50 in the early 1980s, and silver was down to three and a half by 1993. I was looking at silver and gold anecdotally um, as part of macro analysis that I was doing for my first boss, um, an Israeli named Avi Tiomkin, who's a brilliant macro strategist. And as a consequence of some very good calls that I'd made on geopolitics and the impact that they would have on financial markets, he hired me to, as it were, see around corners. Um, looking at precious metals was purely anecdotal. We were focused more on currencies, but the price of silver intrigued me and I looked into it further. I found the chart extremely compelling. And then I looked into the fundamentals and it was very obvious to me that not only was the cycle about to turn up, but that the zeitgeist, the conventional wisdom at the time um, was completely mistaken. Uh, the general view, even in the 1990s, was that silver halide would uh, be phased out in favor of digital, um, which in many respects has turned out to be true. But the, um, the analysis that people did um, gave them the false impression that if you remove the roughly one third of demand that uh, came from silver halide film for silver, um, you'd cripple the commodity. They really didn't understand that by that time, 90% of silver um, used in film was coming back into the market after being recycled. And there was a systemic deficit of between 20 and 30% a year overall. And so my view was that silver inventories would con continue to come down. Uh, my enclosures had suggested to me complete capitulation and um, that this was a generational opportunity. And so I created a silver mining company, despite having no background um, in anything related to mining. In fact, I kept it quiet for a long time because I thought um, it might seem a little bit odd for someone with my background to create a mining company. Um, but I got lucky. I used whatever financial resources I had to option properties. And then I was able to meet with Soros, um, who thought, hmm, this was a brilliant strategy to buy mines or option mines that were shut down. Um, the only question for them was whether I was the guy to implement it or not. And um, I said, well, let's see. And I said, if it's not, I'll be the first one to recede because I'll be the largest shareholder in the company. I made a pretty good deal with them um, when they became investors. Um, but they accepted my idea on the cycles. Um, interestingly enough, I think it was because of my um, history background and because of the credentials that I had that um, they said, you know what, we'll give this kid a chance. He obviously knows how to go deeply enough into a subject. Um, and if he's right, then silver could do what he said it would. I said silver had a better chance of going back to 50 than it had of going to two, which was the conventional wisdom at that time. And that began my career. Soros uh, famously articulated your point of view by saying he made his fortune by finding widely held precepts that were wrong and betting against them. What mm -hmm. I'm curious about, Tom, and I think probably several other entrepreneurs are curious about this too, is uh, how you convinced a cagey old pro like Soros that your background uh, of being an Oxford history grad uh, prepared you for the rough and tumble business of starting and operating a mining company. Particularly, it must be added, uh, in that famously docile jurisdiction, Bolivia. Well, at the time, I would option properties in Mexico, Honduras, Bolivia and Peru. And it was the early 90s. There were very, very few silver bulls at that time. Uh, Ross Beatty was uh, starting Pan American. Bob Quartermain, of course, 
um, with Silver Standard. And then I came into the story and we were private. Um, but the way that I was able to convince um, Paul Soros, uh, George's older brother, and an absolutely brilliant engineer. He was very wealthy even before George created the quantum fund and Paul actually gave him money to put into the fund. Um, I met with Paul Soros and he said, as I just articulated, he said, we think your plan is brilliant. Um, we just don't know with your background whether you can implement it. They said, so we have your little private placement memorandum um, and some of these properties are in Peru. Would you mind if we called um, Alberto Benavides, who was the don of mining in Peru, the most respected man and an unbelievable gentleman. Um, and Don Alberto and I had met a couple of times in, uh, uh, in Lima. And he liked me a lot. First of all, I was the only other person other than him that he had met who was bullish on silver. And he was you know, bullish on silver, but of course the company was refocusing on gold um, in its joint venture with Newmont at Yanacocha. But still, he was, silver was his first love. And I was very open with him. Uh, I made a decision that I could trust him. And so I had told him open book, the things that I was looking at in Peru and the options that I'd struck. And um, so when Paul Soros said to me, you know, we've just bought Jimmy Goldsmith out of uh, his position in Newmont and they'd just become uh, the largest shareholder of Newmont. Um, and we got to know, I said, I went down to South America and we got to know uh, Alberto Benavides. Would you mind if we told him what you were looking at and what we were up to and asked him his opinions on the properties that you have? And I said, no, I, I know Don Alberto and uh, yeah, please feel free, ask anybody you want. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that, you know, an educated consumer is the best customer. Anyway, they called up Don Alberto. This was about an hour after I met with Paul in his office in New York. And um, he called me back um, by noon and he said, we're in and we're gonna do the whole 10 million. Um, that's our condition. And I said, okay, well, my condition is that you'll only invest in silver through my company. I don't wanna be one of the jockeys that you back. And of course, this was at the height of their fame, uh, having participated in, if not helped trigger um, the collapse of the British pound in which at that time he'd made a billion dollars in a day. And, um, I said, so it's either me or not at all. And they said, well, you know, we can't guarantee that. We have a lot of sub managers. So we'd have to check to see if anyone has any interest in silver mining. And so I said, well, okay, you'll do that. So anyway, they did. And nobody had an interest in silver mining. Talk about a great anecdotal indicator. But I asked him, I said, what made you make up your mind so quickly? And he said, well, I put a call in through to Don Alberto. And I asked him, do you know Tom? He said, yes. He said, what do you think of him? He said, I like him a lot. Um, he said, what do you think of the properties that he's looking at? And he said, well, I'll tell you, Paul. Um, if Tom doesn't exercise those options, I will. And that was it. And that was the beginning of my career. That's when they understood that I may be uh, destined to be an Oxford Don, but before that, I might have a career in mining. Certainly a career in mining, uh if you go about your business correctly is, uh, let's just say that it allows you to have more bad habits afterwards. You mentioned, um, perhaps in response to my reference to Bolivia, that you had optioned properties in Peru, which was of course just coming off the shining path. Mexico, right. um, maybe the best of the lot, but that's damning it by faint praise, Honduras. Could you talk a little bit about your experience as an investor with political risk and perhaps how your background in history uh, allows you to make judgments with regards, consider judgments with regards to political risk? That's a brilliant question. Um, 
if it's okay with you, I'll take that in pieces because my perception and in fact, my actions with regard to political risk assessment have changed dramatically over the years. Um, as you noted, um, I made my bones, as they say, in uh, Bolivia. Um, that's where uh, the team that um, I assembled, led by Dr. Larry Buchanan, made the discovery of San Cristobal. Um, we had an amazing local Bolivian partner, uh, Johnny Delgado, um, who became the manager of uh, all of our operations in Bolivia. We actually absorbed his consulting firm um, into our company. And uh, Johnny and uh, Larry um, helped to put together the land position and to identify what really became, I think, the greatest silver discovery um, of our generation. Um, so I was extremely lucky. And in fact, I think that you will find, I hope you will find amongst the people that you speak with, that um, if they're being truthful and they haven't uh, lost the ability to keep their feet on the ground, particularly in the mining industry, if they don't acknowledge the importance of luck, um, then as far as I'm concerned, they're dead. They just haven't been buried yet. Um, you know, when you think of the odds of finding a San Cristobal in Bolivia were somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 to one, which are the odds in you know, really grassroots exploration. Um, and that was my first go round. Then you really have to acknowledge that uh, La Fortuna is kind um, or she's fickle. Most of the time, she won't give you what you want, which, you know, if it weren't the case, gold would be at uh, $20, not near 2,000. Um, so we got really, really, really lucky in Bolivia. It was also at a time when mining jurisdictions were competing with each other um, to be perceived as being open for business. Peru, of course, was the poster child at that time. Um, New months foray into Yanacocha was uh, working out extremely well. That got the competitive juices of their rivals um, moving forward in jurisdictions that were inconceivable. Um, in the early 1990s, certainly late 1980s, um, mining companies wanted to be in the United States. That's where literally deposits were valued using a 0% discount rate because they were arbitraged against what were considered to be the risky jurisdictions. You know what those were? Canada, Australia, and South Africa. By the mid 90s, because of Newmont's success in Peru, um, everyone was looking you know, for, to find the gold where the gold is, regardless. So people were going into Uzbekistan, Indonesia, um, Congo, uh, you name it. And in fact, the system became completely skewed in terms of valuation where people gave the premium valuation to the countries which were in the frontier over those which were in the, um, the countries, the jurisdictions which were so yesterday. One of the reasons was people said, you know, these countries are open for business. Um, permitting is easier. Um, bureaucracy is easier in the United States. It's a cumbersome process, Canada, cumbersome process. So we went from um, being in places where the jurisdiction was considered to be safe to those jurisdictions which were considered to be more, um, more easy to lubricate um, in the sense that you could manage to get in and operate much, uh, much easier. I became, at least for an American, not being a Canadian or an Aussie, I sort of became the poster child for that kind of um, mentality. So, you know, I was acquiring properties or positions in Central America, Mexico, South America, um, Central Asia. We were in Tajikistan. Um, we were in um, Kyrgyzstan, uh, went out to Uzbekistan. Um, I was in Mongolia before Bob Friedland and had tied up a property on the Russian border called Azgat. 
Um, so as far as I was concerned, from Mexico to Mongolia, everything was fair game. And I had the advantage of being a historian, very widely exposed uh, from my youth uh, to travel. And I took advantage of it. And in Bolivia, we made a couple of hundred times our money. Soros actually made more money on the $10 million that he invested with me in, uh, in my first company and in Bolivia um, than he did on the 400 million that he invested in Newmont. Um, we had a category killer discovery and that became part of my stock in trade, which was I really only would look at things that um, could really move the needle for any company. I've always believed that the best downside risk are having exposure to great assets. But as far as jurisdiction was concerned, I was entirely promiscuous and um, found myself at one point having probably the largest portfolio of mineral rights in the Islamic world from Mauritania, Niger, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, uh, Senegal, Burkina Faso, all the way through to Pakistan, um, where we were the largest holder of mineral rights. It's one of the things that got me engaged with sovereign wealth funds was that I realized that this nice Jewish boy from New York had better have uh, some big brothers who would um, tell these countries, you know, he's with us. And that began a fabulous relationship with the Gulf Arabs, which remains my greatest partnership still today. So the political risk issue is extremely important. I've moved 180 degrees. Um, since 2010-ish, we've gone from 50% um, non-North America um, to 90% North America, 95% North America and Australia, um, and I intend to keep it that way. I genuinely believe that the era of the frontier mentality for investors in mining is over. Um, the reason I can talk about it and people would say, yes, 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 but you own, you know, Nova Gold and, you know, you own assets in the United States and Canada and Australia and all of that. And I say, yeah, you know, I'm talking my own book only for the same, only for the reason that I literally wrote the book on how to make a killing in Bolivia. Then my next killing was in Zimbabwe, then South Africa, then Kibale. I sold Kibale to, uh, to Randgold and Anglo, to Mark Bristow. Um, so I was not squeamish. And for an American, probably the least squeamish. When we went into um, Afghanistan, the Department of Defense came to me to become the champion of American uh, mining in Afghanistan. One of the reasons being I was the largest holder of mineral rights in Pakistan. And I said, I'm not going to do it. I've been in this movie before. I know how it ends. We lower the flag. You know, we blow taps on the trumpet. Um, and if I happen to be lucky enough to find anything, um, I'll be sitting there all by myself with a big hole in the ground. And I said, congratulations, you've now made Afghanistan safe for Chinese investment, which is exactly what happened and they bought the great Einak copper deposit um, and the rest is history. And the rest unfor unfortunately is unfolding to be history as we watch the United States um, exit with the Taliban chasing us out. So, you know, when I look at political risk, I say to myself, that's where I began my career. I had the relative advantage of understanding these countries deeply, um, but I came to the conclusion that ultimately, and I do believe this particularly with regard to precious metals, um, we are going to see that in most countries, gold and silver mines will be nationalized, either outright or through stealth. And, you know, when I think that jurisdiction was not even considered a risk when I got into the business and now it's the number one risk, um, it is a very, very, very cautionary tale. And if I had to impart one piece of advice to your audience, it's you can make a lot of money in North America and Australia, and most importantly, you can sleep well at night. Once you've done the fundamental analysis and you believe the gold and silver are a place to be, then 90% of the rest, if you really wanna make just 10 times your money or 20 times your money, is having patience and having conviction. For me, conviction is measured in terms of my ability to sleep well at night, and I can't sleep well at night being in jurisdictions any longer where when I wake up in the morning, I might not own 
what I thought I owned the night before. And if I didn't feel that way, I never would have left because I loved it. I've been to 110 countries. My best friends are, you know, from the Middle East and Africa and Asia. Um, you know, I was educated in Europe. I'm about as cosmopolitan as they get, but I'll tell you something. The real money is going to be made in being in safe assets, great assets, in jurisdictions where the rule of law is not a novelty. So I love Bolivia. I actually learned ethics from Bolivian peasants. Um, it's a great story. I, I learned really what honor means from Bolivians, normal people, um, people living in the Andes. Um, they taught me a, a level of integrity and decency that I've never encountered on Wall Street. Um, and I will always be indebted to them. Um, but uh, I unfortunately do believe that that era um, of going where the gold is or going where the silver is, has to be supplanted. So my strategy from the very beginning was acquire great assets that give you leverage to an underlying theme. And that theme I would determine from my own fundamental analysis. Um, my corollary to that now is that acquire assets that give you leverage to an underlying theme, dot, 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 in jurisdictions that will allow you to keep the fruits of that leverage when you want to ring the cash register. There aren't that many left, Rick. Um, you know, I know that this puts me up against a lot of people, but you know, put my track record you know, next to theirs, and I think I've got some credibility on the subject. You do, and we'll return to the political risk theme uh, as well uh, as the Middle Eastern theme. But I want to go back to the beginning of your response. Many of our listeners won't be able to remember that far back, by the way, but we'll try. Uh, you talked hey, about- Yeah, I'm sure. Told you brevity wasn't my strong suit. You talked about the fact that you'd been lucky. And part of these discussions have to do with the process of becoming serially lucky. And I'm wondering if that serial luck is strategy, a contrarian streak, Persistence, tenacity, courage. Let's look at you as an example. I don't know all of your successes, but I certainly uh, remember Apex. I certainly remember the ore, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, I also know that you have been, which you don't talk about much, a very successful equities market investor, as well as, well as being successful in other explorations. If one assumes that each individual success is a consequence of a one in 3,000 or one in 5,000 or one in 10,000 set of circumstance, there must be some way in this cosmic casino of affecting the odds. And perhaps you could talk about how you and your team, your backers, however you did it, how you affected the odds. Let's, let's talk about the how-to uh, of luck. Well, the first thing in a, in, a, in a general sense is you can't take yourself seriously. Um, I'm a aspiring stoic in terms of my approach to philosophy. And the first thing that you understand if you meet, read Marcus Aurelius, um, who of course was the most powerful man in the world at that time, the first thing that he says is, I'm nothing but a grain of sand uh, on the beach in the universe. And if you actually believe that, um, you're embarked upon a journey in which um, you want to keep an, a very, very open mind and not. Um, you know, not believe your own press. Um, for me, when I got into this business, knowing what I didn't know, which was enormous, um, I surrounded myself with people whose job was to challenge me, um, whose job was to tell me the truth. I've been in business now for 27 years. I have never once fired anyone for telling me that I'm wrong or that they think that I'm wrong. By the way, they can even be wrong in thinking that I'm wrong if it, turn, if it turns out that way. That's okay. Their job is to tell me what they genuinely believe. And I think anyone who works for me will say that um, that's the truth. I adhere to 
what I call Solomon's precept, which is that as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. I think the reason why we've never been taken out on a stretcher uh, is that um, we've scrubbed the stories um, to the point where even if we're not successful, we know exactly why we weren't successful. That then becomes a function of um, the leverage, that becomes a function of the odds. Um, I'm not um, averse to risk. I make the assumption every time I approve a drill program and I've never stopped drilling in 20 some odd years. Um, I think Robert Friedland was asked, you know, one of your, the keys to success, just never stop drilling. I've been doing that always. Um, and I'm lucky. Now, what makes me luckier in exploration because the public market investments, when we've, let's say, taken control of companies, um, usually those things have already been discovered. Nova Gold being the perfect example. I coveted Nova Gold um, for a long, long time before we swooped in and saved it from bankruptcy. I didn't own one share until um, we took it over. Um, but in terms of exploration, what narrowed the odds for me was, first of all, meeting. A, an amazing geologist, already widely acclaimed by the time that um, we were first acquainted. His name is Dr. Larry Buchanan, very famous in the geology world for um, a principle of identifying mineral deposits and epithermal systems at depth uh, without any out outcrop. It's became known as the Buchanan model. He taught at the Colorado School of Mines, um, probably the most modest, um, and humble man um, when compared to his pedigree and his successes that I've ever met. And he's been my chief geologist from the very beginning of my career. Um, and he continues to make discoveries um, for us. And I love him to pieces as a friend, he's a real brother. Um, but most importantly, in his case, um, he was such a hard ass on looking at properties. And he really saved me from myself. When I got into the silver business, we were approached with about a hundred prospects in Mexico. I hired him as a consultant. He rejected every single one of them. So when I sent him to Bolivia, a country to which he'd never uh, traveled before, um, to see some properties that I'd, I'd optioned there, after having rejected everything in Mexico that he'd seen, when he called me up, he called me up and he said, Dr. Kaplan, it was very formal at that time. And I said, yes, Dr. Buchanan. I um, mean, he said, are you sitting down? And I thought, oh, crap. Um, now what? Um, and he said, well, I know that you consider that I'm a real hard ass on these things. But um, if I'm right with what I see, this will be the biggest silver discovery in a generation. And that was San Cristobal. And so I got very lucky with surrounding myself with great people, but all of the people, most of whom are still with me from early on in my career, almost all of them, um, are characterized by incredible candor. And if I think that somebody is blowing smoke, um, then I will fire them because then they let down my entire team and that team makes money and that money supports various ecosystems, including saving leopards and big cats with Panthera. Um, so I can't let people let down the team by telling me what they think I wanna hear. And I would say that that's probably a very good life lesson that anyone can walk away with, which is to say um, a true friend, a true ally, a true partner tells it the way it is and don't shoot the messenger, give them a hug when they do it. They may be right. Even if they're wrong, unless they're always wrong, in which case you have a systemic issue, um, that's who you want to surround yourself with. That's what can take a thousand to one odds or ten thousand to one odds down to maybe ten to one, twenty to one. It's good enough if you've experienced making a hundred times your money, um, as we did in silver and platinum and hydrocarbons and I hope gold. Um, if you can keep those odds, you'll do it really, really well. And if you're in a jurisdiction that'll allow you to keep it when you find it, you'll make a generational fortune. 
Now, what are the odds of that happening? Really small. I'm not sure I would suggest, you know, that people go into this business. It's sort of like children, don't try this at home. You know, these are sharp instruments. But if I'm right, then the kinds of things that you will be advising your clients to buy, particularly in safe places, um, if the assets are great, i.e. something that anyone would want to own at a price, um, your clients are going to make a lot of money. This is a generational trade in the precious metals and the mining equities. It's interesting that your answer to the question about being seriously lucky was eerily similar to the answers provided both by Jim Bob Moffat, uh, another well-known explorationist, and Robert Friedland, hire very, very smart people, buy intellectual capital, and then, uh, as Jim Bob said, interrogate them mercilessly, uh, which is, uh, in effect, what you said. Let's, um, do I want to go there? Sure, sure. Uh, let's move on to your idea of a jurisdictional change. Uh, is this a consequence of your read of the march of sociology and politics and frontier markets? Is this by contrast uh, a read on your march uh, in terms of the political and social will of the United States, Canada, or Mexico? Does this come from a historical precept or did you just get tired as a young Jewish boy going to Muslim countries, I mean. <laughs> no, on the contrary, I'm much more comfortable in Muslim countries than I am anywhere else. And I'm much more comfortable with my Arab partners um, than anyone else. Um, it has nothing to do with that. Uh, I loved working in the developing world, but I came to the conclusion that Woody Allen was right when he said, I'm not afraid of death. I just don't wanna be there when it happens. And I'm not talking about physical security. I'm talking about once countries start to play with um, the mining companies, um, it's like popcorn. It's like potato chips. Nobody can eat just one. And you have to understand the psychology of it is this. And we're, I mean, we're seeing it all over Africa, all over Asia. I don't really, I could go into the specifics, but um, it's, it's so hard to think of the jurisdictions that used to be considered favorable and have now become practically uninvestable. It almost hurts the heart. Uh, it certainly hurts the ears because when I got into the business, they were all great and they were all competing to be open, transparent, welcoming. Now, because you've had uh, the beginning of this um, resource nationalism, everyone has to play along. Just look at the psychology of it. When one country changes the rules, um, every one of its neighbors looks and says, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, they got away with it. And by the way, they will always get away with it. You know, the days when um, the US government would come to the rescue of United Fruit Company, um, or the British would come to the rescue of the Anglo-Iranian oil company. I mean, those days are over. Nobody cares whether mining companies um, of any stripe, um, precious metals mining companies, most of all, get taken over by foreign governments. You know, mining companies generally tend to be viewed um, askance. They're no longer the component in indexes that they used to be. So even though mining companies provide fabulous um, resources that make the world a better place, and by the way, with much, much, much smaller footprints than things like agriculture, um, you know, or, or livestock or any of those things, those things killing the world. Mining is a tiny, tiny footprint for all the benefits that we get from it. But let's put that aside for the moment. Um, once it starts, it can't stop. Because if the neighbors of the country that's just broken ranks um, are democracies, then the opposition will hammer the incumbent government to get the same kind of equality as uh, the other country got. Otherwise, the government will be viewed as being in the pockets of the mining companies. And there you have commissions of inquiries about corruption. Um, even dictators in those countries um, have a street 
and feel that um, if they don't change the rules, uh, then they will be perceived as um, having been paid off. So the psychology um, leads to a domino effect. And that kind of momentum is what made me realize that um, I really was in that movie and that um, it wasn't so much talking my own book. This was uh, really almost pre Novigold days. Um, but I realized that I had gone to the last chapter in the book and it wasn't a happy ending. And so again, you know, I'm not afraid of death. I just didn't want to be there when it happened. But more than that, I also realized that because of the skewed nature of the way that people were valuing assets in these frontier markets versus the ones in North America, I could reposition myself to North America and get fabulous value cheaper than in the frontier markets. So from every standpoint, the risk reward scenario was skewed to um, going into these other, uh, or going coming back, repatriating myself to the jurisdictions um, which, um, which are safe. Where the rule of law, the rule of law and private property still means something in North America and Australia. I have a feeling that that's going to change radically uh, it's already changing. I don't want to just, you know, be pessimistic and a downer, but I think that that era is well and truly over. It's interesting you say that, Tom, when you generalized to North America. I, of course, am a recent leaver of the People's Republic of California, <laughs> precisely because of what I see as the erosion of the rule of law. Uh, but let's move on a little bit. Um, do you think the political reality in North America um, is favorable to mining or relatively favorable to mining? And do you think without becoming um, too political that a uh, Biden election or a Trump re-election is either favorable or negative with regards to mining investments in the United States? And if you felt, uh, if you felt comfortable making enemies north of the border, uh, how do you feel about the Trudeau administration with regards to extractive industries? Being that I really believe that you can count the investable jurisdictions now, at least from my perspective on one hand, um, when it comes to North America, for example, I think that you have to take the view that um, private property will be respected. Um, it depends, of course, on who has the property. So, for example, if you're dealing with native corporations um, and they're favorable to mining and it's on private land designated for mining, um, you're in good shape if they're favorable to mining. Um, in fact, they can be fantastic uh, partners and a phenomenal support system with regard to permitting and, uh, and the rest. Um, if you're in a place where people are hostile, yeah, then it's going to be difficult. Um, the difference in North America is that I genuinely believe that um, the advantage is that, sure, the permitting process can be very long, very tedious, but I'm generally in favor of that because I also have very, very strong, you know, conservation um, sentiments. And so I don't mind the idea that it takes a long time to permit something. What I want to know is at the end of the permitting process, when they say you're good to go, do I feel comfortable that I will always own it? Will the rule of law protect me? And I don't feel that that's the case almost anywhere any longer, but I do feel that that's the case in the United States. I don't think it matters um, whether it's Joe Biden or, or Donald Trump. Um, and as far as Canada is concerned, you know, it's like the United States. Um, if you're in a place where they're welcome, they're welcoming you, um, you'll do fine. If you're in a place where the local people are hostile to you, um, then you won't. I mean, you know, we're not going to resort to hurting anybody. Uh, no amount of money is worth that. Um, but I do believe that the politics won't really matter. In Canada, it's more on a provincial level. Um, 
in the United States, some state aspect. But, you know, even in the Great Depression, gold mines weren't nationalized, even when gold was. And I don't see that uh, as an issue. And as far as Mexico is concerned, um, so long as foreigners are treated like Mexicans, I'm okay with it. And they are. Let's move on to a different uh, point you made, which is to say uh, a generational opportunity, which is, I suspect, a reference to precious metals pricing. Um, if I mistook that, no, you got me. So why don't you tell me something from a historic and an economic perspective about why you see this as a generational opportunity? What is it that you see uh, that so many other commentators don't see? First of all, um, if you'd asked me that question a year and a half ago, I wouldn't have taken issue with the very last part of what you said. We're starting to see some very, very, very sophisticated, smart money, what I call bold-faced names, um, who are becoming very constructive on gold. Um, for the contrarians out there, I don't consider myself a contrarian. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm uncomfortable traveling in exactly the opposite direction of the crowd, but it's not because I, ne I, I say I'm contrarian. Um, it's just because sometimes I believe the crowd gets it wrong. Sometimes, of course, the crowd does get it right. Buy and hold has been a very good strategy for decades um, in the stock market. Um, and the thing isn't um, whether the crowd is uh, moving in the same direction, is are they justified in doing it? And in the case of gold, um, I think that we are going from a period in which gold was the asset class that people love to hate um, and hated to love. Um, to being one that smart money is um, starting to understand, makes a lot of sense. And the big money isn't there yet. I mean, these are um, under-owned financial assets. So then the question is, why would you want to own gold? Now, my favorite argument for owning gold um, is that um, the mining industry itself um, is such a disaster. And I love uh, industries where you can take advantage of uh, implosions. And the truth is that the gold industry and the silver industry um, suck uh, in one major way. And that is that there's not very much good stuff out there and certainly not in good jurisdictions. What I think that people are understanding is that the implosion in the gold industry itself is incredibly bullish. I've been in the hydrocarbon business. Um, and in fact, I made much more money in hydrocarbons than I did in mining, although I'm hoping that um, mining will surpass that. But the truth is that um, in hydrocarbons, one of the reasons why I left in 2007 and sold everything was because I no longer felt the same conviction that I had when I got into hydrocarbons, when oil was $18, $19, um, and I was predicting that it would go to 100 sort of similar to the silver concept that silver had a better chance of going to 50 from three and a half than down to two. Um, but by 2008, I no longer had that conviction and I didn't know whether oil was worth 20 or as it happened in 2008, 120. Um, admittedly, I never, you know, I, I never thought it would go to minus 20, but, you know, I clearly understood that something was going on that I didn't quite understand. And that was shale. Now in hydrocarbons, there's plenty of resource, vast resources. Um, there to be unlocked through new technologies, as it was horizontal drilling, fracking. Um, you had vast reservoirs. You don't have that in gold or silver. And the difference is, and this was shocking to me, when I went into energy and we made a big discovery in Texas, we were producers within months. In mining today, if you make a discovery, the time from discovery through to first pour is likely going to be over 20 years 
on average. And when you consider that there have been no discoveries of any meaningful size um, for the last five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years, effectively the horse is already out of the barn. The majors are burning through their reserves faster than they can replace them. No new discoveries, even by juniors. Um, even if they do discover it, it'll take decades to put it into production. So the horse is already out of the barn on uh, the gold industry. And that's just from the supply side. Then you look at the quality side. The average grade of a gold mine has fallen by half over the last decade. So between an absence of size and an absence or deterioration in quality, you're really, really talking about an industry that's crippled. Um, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing for gold. So I like that kind of scenario. By the way, you'll notice that I did not refer to any of what I call the fear factors. Um, I didn't refer to plague even though that's always been on my list um, for the last, I would say, 12 years. Um, I didn't refer to runaway inflation. I didn't refer to a Great Depression. I didn't refer to wars or any of those other things. You know, I, I, I call them the fear factors. Um, and I always believe that people who have to resort to that um, you know, are like uh, Samuel Johnson's comment about patriotism, the last refuge of the scoundrel. Um, and so for me, it's all about understanding because I'm in the industry, just how terrible the industry is. That gives me the opportunity to know that there's no vast amount of supply that can come into the market at any price. And it also tells me that if I've got great assets in safe places, I'm going to make a killing. So. I don't have to be an investor in mining. You know, our balance sheet is primarily our families with some sovereign wealth fund um, money. Um, I choose it because A, I believe it's a great way to protect wealth. But at the same time, because we know the business so well, I believe it's also the best way that I can make money. So from any risk reward standpoint, um, it's really the best investment I can think of on a risk adjusted basis. And when I'm in that position, I sleep well at night. If I sleep well at night, um, I'm not going to be scared out by the inevitable shakeouts that are going to accompany uh, the, the bull market. And I think that is a very important factor, having conviction. The fundamentals for gold and silver are just so, so good from a macro standpoint. And yet I can convince myself that silver should multiply and gold should multiply just based on the fundamentals of the industries themselves, which of course very few people really know intimately. So they're gonna focus on the, on the macros, but I'm telling you the micros themselves are exquisite. Tom, I'm gonna to have you back because this discussion has prompted more questions in me than we have time for. But I note that the backdrop of your picture uh, is a couple of cats. And I want to finish with you uh, talking about uh, some of the rest of your life, uh, what other things you have passion for, and what your uh, luck, as you would have it, your success, has allowed you to do outside of mining. Well, probably the best stroke of luck that I've had um, in my life, other than meeting my wife. We've been together now. 32 years, um, and my family, my kids. Um, other than that, I think the greatest stroke of luck that I had was being born with a very passionate nature. Um, I didn't realize this until later in life, um, but a dear, dear friend of mine, a man who was like a brother to me, um, he was the co-founder with my wife and um, and me in creating Panthera, the late Dr. Alan Rabinowitz, probably the greatest um, wildcat uh, conservationist um, in the world. Um, and he once commented to me, he said, you know, do you know how lucky you are to be passionate? And I said, no, I imagine everybody has that kind of 
passion. And he said, you have no clue. It's not like that at all. He said, for most people, even being able to summon passion for their family is a stretch. And he said, look at what you love, what can motivate you, what makes you jump out of bed in the morning. Uh, the hint is it's not business, actually. Um, I love the people that I work with. Um, I love Larry Buchanan and Igor Leventhal and Ali Irfan and Josh Fink and all of the people um, who work so closely with me and have been working closely with me for decades. Um, they're my family. They are my family of choice. I love you know, the people that um, I've met in the mining industry, some of whom are the most ardent conservationists I've ever met. Ross Beatty, um, Bob Quartermain, who introduced us. Um, you know, I know Rick, I know you, Rick, and, you know, and Bonnie through Bob. And because of Bob, Ross and I became close, and we're all three directors of Panthera. Panthera is probably my greatest passion. Wildlife conservation has always been my greatest passion. I wanted to be you know, a big cat conservationist when I was a kid. Um, but I realized very early on, I had a much greater aptitude and facility for history than I did for science. Um, but when I did make my first fortune in Bolivia, um, I went back and I found Alan Rabinowitz. And I said, what can I do to help you? And that was the origin of Panthera. Um, he allowed me to fulfill myself and I allowed him to fulfill his dreams. Um, I have other passions as well. Um, you know, I collect art um, and don't get so much the joy of collecting uh, any longer as much as sharing it. Um, we have a very large collection of Dutch old masters. Um, we don't live with any of them. We never have, um, you know, we just couldn't see ourselves um, having a Rembrandt on the wall. Um, but all of those paintings have been on loan to museums. We're the only lending library in the old masters. And we fill up a lot of museum uh, collections. And I get a lot of pleasure from seeing people enjoy these paintings, all of which came from the private space and were put into the public domain. Um, you know, I, I love the 92nd Street Y, the greatest cultural institution to my mind in New York City. Um, I'm very keen on giving back in terms of history. We have great programs at Harvard. Um, went back and endowed the Wildlife Conservation Unit and at Oxford. And all of these things just fill me with tremendous joy. I've never once regretted the money that we've given away. Um, I've always felt that that money that was given away um, was money that was well invested. And to the extent that I get joy from business, uh, apart from the people, apart from, you know, the, the, the thrill of getting word back from the assay lab that, uh, that you hit something, um, which is sort of intoxicating, um, and you want to go back and do it again. Um, Apart from that, it's uh, really being able to direct things to things I care about. And I'm lucky that I care about a bunch of things. And I really mean it when I say that I'm lucky because it's true. I now understand that very few people have that kind of passion, but I at least know that uh, my tombstone um, could very well emulate that of the late Malcolm Forbes. And, on the tombstone, it says, when he was alive, he lived. Tom, this has been a delight. Um, what I'd like to do, and I'd like you to frame your mind around this, and I'd like the Real Vision production staff to frame their minds about it. Uh, I'm going to have you back, uh, and we're going to talk about a subject that's occurred to me as a consequence of this interview, which is the new trend to ESG. Um, when I was a younger man, it was called CSR, meaning Corporate Social Responsibility. And I regard it as co corporate social opportunity. So I want the listeners to set their minds to Ruland Kaplan on corporate social opportunity and ESG. But I'd like to thank you personally for this uh, interview series, and I'd like your permission to invite you back. Rick, you had me at hello. You're a pal. Um, you're a pal, and you're really, you know, in, in life, um, 
Bernard Berenson, a great art historian, once commented, he said, in life, there are two kinds of people, life enhancers and life diminishers. And you fall into the category for me of a life enhancer. Um, more so, of course, Bonnie than you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's no comparison there. So, you know, I, I keep in touch with you so that I can be in contact with her. Um, but you're definitely a life enhancer. And um, I'm grateful to Bob Quartermain for bringing us together, as he has uh, with me and, you know, really other great friends. Um, and you can have me back anytime you want. Um, I could try to be brief and I could try to tell you that I'll be brief, but you know, it ain't gonna happen. Leopards can't change their spots. <laughs> Tom, thank you very much. Have a nice day. Anytime. Thank you, Rick. Give my love to Bonnie. Shall do. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.